as promised, the news in detail. Let's begin with our top story. Pakistan has taken diplomatic corps to the line of control to expose India's false claim of destroying so-called terror camps. Foreign Office spokesperson Mohammad Faisal says the Indian side neither joined nor provided the coordinates of the alleged launch pads. Faisal said claims by the Indian Army chief of destroying camps along the LOC have been falsified with irrefutable proof. Pakistan's military spokesperson, Major General Asif Ghafoor, is expected to brief diplomats and media at the site. Meanwhile, Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said this is another diplomatic defeat for New Delhi. In an interview, he said Islamabad has repeatedly asked India to provide the coordinates of those so-called camps, but no response was given. Pakistan's military spokesperson, Major General Asif Ghafoor, said the Indian High Commission could not stand by its own army chief's claims. Well, the United States has once again expressed concern over the crisis in occupied Kashmir due to India's human rights violations. Assistant Secretary of State for South Asia, Alice G. Wells, said Washington is closely monitoring the situation in the occupied valley. In her statement to the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee, Wells rejected India's claims that the situation in the valley is normal since August 5th. She said the U.S. has urged India to respect human rights and to restore full access to media, internet and mobile networks. Wells said thousands of people have been detained over the past two months. The U.S. Congressional Subcommittee of the House of Foreign Affairs is holding a hearing on human rights crisis in the valley today. New Delhi's lockdown and communications blackout in occupied Kashmir has now entered its 79th day. In other news, President Donald Trump says a small number of U.S. troops will remain in Syria to secure oil fields. Speaking at the White House, Trump said the ceasefire between Turkey and Kurdish forces in northern Syria is holding despite some skirmishes. Trump said if Turkey misbehaves, then the U.S. will impose sanctions on Ankara. He said the U.S. never agreed to protect the Kurds for the rest of their lives. Meanwhile, in a telephone call with the Russian leader Vladimir Putin, French President Emmanuel Macron called for an extension of the ceasefire. Macron said tensions in northeast Syria can be resolved through diplomacy. Well, the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says the Syrian government and Kurds have sought Russia's help to start a dialogue. Moscow has emerged as a leading power broker in Syria after it launched a military intervention in 2015. Foreign Minister Lavrov said direct contact between Turkey and Syria is also necessary to stabilize the region. Dialogue between the Kurds and Damascus is needed, and we are ready to encourage this dialogue. Both sides express their interest in Russia's help in this process, and of course, dialogue between Turkey and the Syrian Arab Republic is also needed. The U.S. Special Envoy for Afghanistan, Zalmay Khalilzad, is on a tour to discuss the stalled peace process with Russia, China, and European states. In a statement, the State Department said Khalilzad will travel to Brussels, Paris, and Moscow. It said the envoy will discuss ways to accelerate Afghan peace efforts with allies, including the European Union and NATO. After Europe, the Special Envoy will visit Moscow to meet Russian and Chinese officials. Well, the Taliban have rejected the Pentagon chief Mark Esper's proposal for a partial drawdown of U.S. forces from Afghanistan. In a statement, the group said they will continue to fight until the presence of the last U.S. soldier in the country. Threatening the government, the Taliban said the Kabul administration will pay the price for supporting Washington. They said the government must adopt logic and reason instead of tough talk to ensure peace in the country. The group claims it has captured 28 districts over the past months. Earlier, speaking in Kabul, Esper also pledged to heighten attacks on Taliban positions. He made those comments during a press conference alongside President Ashraf Ghani during his visit to Kabul. Elsewhere, House of Commons leader Jacob Rees-Mogg says UK lawmakers against the government's timetable for Brexit legislation will be voting not to leave the EU on October 31st. 
Earlier, Speaker John Burkle refused to allow the vote on Prime Minister Johnson's Brexit deal. The Speaker said circumstances have not changed since Saturday when MPs backed a move forcing Johnson to ask the EU for a delay in Brexit. He told MPs that debating the motion would be repetitive and disorderly. The government said it plans for the legislation to complete its House of Commons stages by Thursday. This has prompted many lawmakers to complain that this tight schedule will not provide enough time to scrutinize the legislation. Lawmakers will be asked today to approve the proposed timetable known as program motion. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is set to retain power, but as a minority government. Preliminary results show that Trudeau's Liberal Party fell short of securing enough votes to form a majority government. Liberals will now need to work with other parties in Parliament to pass legislation during this next term. Preliminary results show Liberals won 156 out of 338 seats in Monday's vote. Trudeau said the people have voted for a progressive agenda. In a tweet, U.S. President Donald Trump congratulated Trudeau on a wonderful and hard-fought victory. Well, the right-wing Swiss People's Party has won the federal elections in Switzerland. The anti-immigrant party received 25.6% of the votes, marking a slip compared to their last performance. Now, despite the drop in support, the SVP is still the largest party with 54 lawmakers in the 246-member parliament. The Social Democratic Party got 16.5% of the votes to elect 39 lawmakers. Meanwhile, Swiss environmentalist parties recorded momentous gains in national elections. The Green Party received 13% of the votes, while Green Liberal Party gained 7.6%. Switzerland has over 5 million eligible voters, but only 45% of them cast their votes in Sunday's elections. Well, violent clashes have broken out in almost all major cities of Bolivia over results of Sunday's presidential elections. The main opposition candidate rejected the results as President Evo Morales appeared to be inching towards a fourth term. Rival supporters clashed in the capital La Paz and set a local electoral authority headquarters in Sucre City on fire. Carlos Mesa, who came a close second to Morales, denounced the revised results released by election authorities as a fraud. Mesa accused Morales of colluding with the Supreme Electoral Tribunal to avoid a second round runoff vote. The U.S. has also condemned the Electoral Tribunal's attempts to subvert Bolivian democracy by delaying the vote count. Israel's Benjamin Netanyahu has given up on his dream of a fourth term as prime minister. Haunted by corruption scandals, Netanyahu failed to form a coalition for the second straight time in two consecutive elections this year. Netanyahu said he is returning the mandate to President Reuven Rivlin, making the way for Benny Gantz to now form a government. Gantz will have 28 days to try to form a government. In case he fails to negotiate a unity coalition, President Reuven Rivlin will ask a majority of parliament members to agree on the candidate. Rivlin has vowed to do all he can to prevent a third election since April. Gantz's Blue and White Party has made it clear that they will not enter government with the Likud party, while Netanyahu is still their head. Well, the news coming out of Lebanon, the cabinet there has approved a package of reforms to pacify protesters calling for the government's removal. Speaking after the cabinet meeting, Prime Minister Saad Hariri said no new taxes will be imposed in next year's budget. However, protesters have rejected the reform, saying they do not trust any plan by the current government. Massive protests have rocked all major Lebanese cities over allegations of fiscal indiscipline and corruption. The demonstrations are the biggest in Lebanon since 2005. With tens of thousands of people on the streets across the country, the government rushed to implement the long-delayed reforms. The cabinet approved many austerity measures, including the slashing of lawmakers' salaries by 50%. A 50% reduction in salaries of current and ex-lawmakers and ministers. 4. A reduction in the budget of the Development and Reconstruction Committee, the Fund for the Displaced and the Committee of the South by 70%. 
Prime Minister Haredi also announced that the government will privatize power production plants within four months. Haredi said he supports the protesters' demand for early elections. <laughs> You have to know your voice is being heard and if early election is something that you want in order to make sure that your voice is being heard, then I, Saad Hariri, will personally support you in this. Hailing the protesters, Hariri said the demonstrations have put the Lebanese national identity back in its place. Japan's new emperor, Naruhito, has been formally enthroned at the imperial palace in a grand ceremony. The emperor officially began his reign in May after the abdication of his father, Akihito. The centuries-old ceremony at the Sidon State Hall was attended by hundreds of dignitaries from around the world. The enthronement of His Majesty the Emperor is being celebrated as a national holiday all over Japan. Congratulatory banners are flying at subway stations and street corners all across the country. However, the celebratory mood has been tempered by Typhoon Hagibis, which tore through Japan last week. Naruhito is the nation's first monarch who was born after World War II. Welcome back. Let's begin with news coming out of Facebook, which has suspended a network of Instagram accounts linked to a Russian agency accused of meddling in U.S. politics. Facebook's head of cybersecurity policy, Nathaniel Gleischer, said the operators posed as people within the United States. He said the network showed some links to Russia's Internet Research Agency, an organization blamed for meddling in the 2016 U.S. elections. Gleischer said it also suspended three separate networks operating from Iran. Facebook has announced new steps to fight foreign interference and misinformation ahead of the November 2020 elections. Washington has forewarned that Russia, Iran and other countries may attempt to sway the result of next year's presidential vote. Moscow and Tehran have repeatedly denied such allegations. Well, there's a grim cleanup underway in the Mexican city of Culiacan a week after deadly clashes there between drug cartels. They were sparked by the government's arrest of drug lord Joaquin El Chapo Guzman's son. More on this report. As government authorities and uh, Kulikan residents struggled to make sense of how their city was easily infiltrated by armed criminals last week, others have busied themselves in repairing the damage. I think that local businesses are only today reviewing what the damage is to their stores. And I think it's going to take a few days for businesses to re-establish themselves again. Those who saw the violence complain that local police and the Mexican armed forces were easily overwhelmed by fighting from the cartels. Some even suspect that the authorities may be colluding with the criminals they are supposed to be fighting. It's infuriating because you have to ask yourself, who is really in charge? If these soldiers, these people, the state, municipal and transit police are colluding with them, what are we going to do? Who can we tell what's happening to us if the authorities are in on it? The Sinaloa cartel was also successfully able to pressure the Mexican authorities into releasing Joaquin Guzman's son. 62-year-old El Chapo was sentenced to life in prison in the U.S. last July. Since then, his sons have tried to fill his shoes. But those familiar with the drug trade in Mexico call them flashy party boys who don't have what it takes to run a ruthless drug empire. In Brazil, thousands of volunteers have taken part in removing thick oil sludge from 200 northeastern beaches. Calling it a threat to wildlife, the environmental agency Ibama said at least 15 sea turtles, two seabirds and a fish have been killed due to the oil spill. It said the oil sludge has been mysteriously washing up along 1,300 miles of coastline since September. Ibama President Eduardo Beam said tests have proven the crude oil was produced in Venezuela. Officials had not been able to identify the vessel responsible for the leak yet. Venezuela has denied responsibility for the oil.
Let's begin business news in Asia, where most stock markets are trading fractionally higher on rising optimism of a trade deal between the U.S. and China. But gains have been constrained by Brexit uncertainty. Tokyo's Nikkei 225 index has picked up a quarter of a percent, while Hong Kong's Hang Seng index is flat. The Shanghai Composite is marginally lower as investors await news of third quarter corporate earnings. But the Kospi index in Seoul has picked up 1% on the back of gains by tech stocks. Time to find out what the weather is like around the world. And there you have it. You're all caught up. Thank you for watching this bulletin here at Houston.